With her exotic beauty, blue skin, and unconventional Jedi attire, Ayla Securi emerged as one of the most beloved and recognizable Twi'leks in the Star Wars universe, representing the first character to successfully make the transition from the comic book to the big screen. It was the year 1983. Return of the Jedi had just been released and, well, Star Wars was dead. And the truth is that at this point in the franchise, it seemed it had already reached its peak. A divorce. The need to take care of his kids. The exhaustion of making the trilogy. A still primitive computer technology. The need to make other projects. It's hardly surprising George Lucas wanted to take a break at that moment. But everything changed with the release of The Phantom Menace on May 19, 1999 a date that marked a new beginning for Star Wars. The dormant franchise had awoken. With this in mind, publisher Dark Horse Comics embraced this new era and created several new Jedi characters for the main Star Wars 1998 title to stand alongside their movie counterparts, with Isla Sakura as one of the standout characters of this new age. She was created by writer John Ostrander and artist Jan Dursima who also conceived Sakura's master Quinlan Vos in the female Twi'lek Sith Darth Talon, a character George Lucas liked so much that was to become the main antagonist in his sequel trilogy. The early design of the character was originally very different. Sakura was first conceived as a fish-like creature, a concept that later evolved into the Jedi Kit Fisto. Instead, the creators decided she should be a blue Twi'lek, a species that first appeared in Return of the Jedi in the characters of Ula, and Bib Fortuna. Once the design was finished, the writers gave her some background by making her the cousin of an existing character, Nat Sakura, a male Twi'lek and heir to the famous and influential clan Sakura from Ryloth. Isla made her debut on June 28, 2000, inside the pages of issue 19 of the Star Wars Republic series. But this also was going to be her last as writer John Ostrander originally wanted to kill Sakura, but fortunately was convinced by John Dursma's daughter to let her live. When it came to clothing, a high level of uniformity was expected from the Jedi as they were discouraged from focusing on materialistic objects. But this was not the case for Isla Sakura, who stood out among them by ditching their traditional tunics. So why did she choose to wear such tight-fitting and seductive outfits? The simple explanation is that she looks sexy, and thus appealing to a specific male audience. However, there's also a more interesting lore explanation. Twi'leks were one of the most common yet diverse species in the galaxy, and were seen as exotic and beautiful due to their colorful skin and fit body. This was also their downfall, as Twi'leks were an oppressed people who were often looked down upon by others who saw them as a lesser species who existed only for entertainment and space mining. Certainly, this was also going to be Sakura's fate, but Quinlan Voss discovered her and took her to be trained as a Jedi. Despite being ashamed of her nature at first, even wearing the traditional Jedi robes, she could fully embrace her Twi'lek identity with the help of her master, whom she formed a powerful force bond with. Eventually, she chose to break the stereotypes by wearing an outfit that was tied to what her people were expected to wear. That made her look like an ordinary Twi'lek slave. But she was a Jedi Master who believed that could inspire young girls by showing others that she was a capable Twi'lek, despite what her outfit said. By the early 2000s, the Twi'lek heroine was already an established character and very well known among comic book readers. But this was about to change. Despite having a certain disregard for the expanded universe, considering it as side material to his main story, George Lucas decided to turn the comic book character into a living Jedi after being struck by a dramatic cover of the ongoing Star Wars comic book title. By that time, Episode 2 had already finished shooting and was in the post-production process at ILM. It was clear that the late new edition would have no dialogue and would be involved in a combat sequence, but there wasn't time to go through the usual casting process. To solve this, George Lucas showed the comic book cover to one of the production managers, hoping that she could find the right person for the role. Immediately, she went to see an ILM employee of hers, thinking they looked very much alike. Now, what do I do? Locked out. 
Even I can't get past the security. That person was Amy Allen, a production assistant who had recently got into the company. Allen had already played a Blue Twi'lek in a modification to The Phantom Menace for the DVD release, where we see Senator Orrin Freitas' formerly human-filled pod, populated with Twi'leks. The process for becoming the Twi'lek Jedi would take around four hours. They put her hair in little buns and then placed a skull cap, which they glued down with some prosthetics so it would stay on. Sakura's cone-shaped ears were made from foam rubber so that they would be malleable in a way similar to earlobes. As the movie was already in post-production, her character had to be digitally inserted in the background. This meant Amy Allen had to shoot her scenes all alone, without a chance to stand beside any actor. Isla Secura's most identifiable scenes are those at the Geonosis Arena. But if you have sharp eyes, you'll notice she also appears in some background shots at the Jedi Temple, and also at the Battle of Geonosis, leading the clones in one of the greatest ensemble of Jedi ever seen in live action. We will not be hostages to be bartered, Dooku. Since her appearance in the prequels, Amy Allen, being a hardcore Star Wars fan, has embraced the character and is a recurrent guest at Star Wars conventions. Due to her efforts and leadership during Geonosis, Ayla Secura was given her own clone force, the 327th Star Corps, with Commander Bly as her second in command, as well as her own fleet group in the Republic Armada. During the final days of the war, the 327th and Secura, having been granted the rank of Master, what? were deployed to the Outer Rim planet Felucia. Their mission was to capture Shumai, who was already on Mustafar with other members of the Separatist Council, and to uncover a Commerce Guild plot to poison Felucia's water supply. It was during this time that Sakura attended a meeting along with Windu, Yoda, Anakin, Kiarimundi, and then joined by Ahsoka Tano. But that was not Sakura's first time in Felucia. The planet evoked dreadful feelings to her, as it was here where she had to bury her beloved pet, learning a valuable lesson as it was now part of the Force. Ironically enough, Sakura would also meet her end on this planet, being one of the most brutal and heartbreaking deaths of Order 66. While preparing to engage an oncoming onslaught of Separatist tanks, the 327th received the fatal order from Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Being distracted by a bird soaring into the sky, she found herself defenseless as the clones she had placed her trust in and risked her life for shot her in the back. But this was not enough for them. As she crumpled beneath a large fungal tree, her troops continued to hammer her inert body with blaster fire, making sure she was dead. But was that really the reason? Well, not according to the 501st journal from the 2005 video game Star Wars Battlefront 2. In this journal entry, a retired member of the 501st recounts his stay on Felucia, to reinforce the 327th Star Corps under Sakura's command. The story is not canon anymore, but it suggests the clones just wanted to make sure her death was swift and painless out of respect. Our sanity, for our lives. When her death came, I hope it was quick. She earned that much. When the 501st was finally rotated out of Felucia, Ayla Sakura made a point of seeing us off personally calling us the bravest soldiers she had ever seen. It's a good thing we were wearing helmets, because none of us could bear to look her in the eye. While Sakura didn't have a single line of dialogue in Episodes 2 and 3, The Revenge of the Sith's graphic novel, illustrated screenplay, and the animatic for the scene showed that Sakura was meant to have two lines during her death, asking Bly if he thought there were hostiles nearby, only to be shot at after. Why? Do you think they're droids? No. The animatic also shows the deaths of other iconic Jedi that did not make it into the movie, such as Barisofi, Luminara Unduli, and Secura's master Quinlan Voss. Oh! 
Following Sakura's death, the Empire falsely stated that she was executed because she was the one who had been trying to contaminate Felucia's water supply. However, despite those lies, she was remembered for generations by the people of the world she had helped during her life, with stories of her to have become part of their own culture. Isla Sakura remains one of the most beloved Jedi ever. Even to this day, it's difficult to imagine a character with that little amount of screen time, but with that great of an impact on the collective memory. Aware of the love fans had for her, Filoni rescued Sakura for The Clone Wars, where she was voiced by prolific voice actress Jennifer Hale. Sakura was given a French-type accent, as per George Lucas's request. Considering the nature of Ryloth in the Clone Wars era, it is possible Lucas wanted her to resemble World War II resistance fighters in France. Be mindful of your surroundings, Padawan. Those creatures are still out there. Sakura was also introduced in the show as a mentor relationship for Ahsoka. The Twi'lek was an unconventional Jedi not only for her clothing, but also because of the two Force bonds she had formed in the past. Namely with the Jedi Kit Fisto, and with her master Quinlan Voss. But having mastered to let go of these attachments, she always tried to pass on what she had learned to others. These lessons will pay off for Ahsoka, as seen when she left the Jedi Order and Anakin. It's just... I get so confused sometimes. It's forbidden for Jedi to form attachments, yet we are supposed to be compassionate. It is nothing to be ashamed of, Ahsoka. I went through the same process when I was your age with my own master. Really? You? He was like a father to me. I realized that for the greater good, I had to let him go. Don't lose a thousand lives just to save one. But I have to sort this out on my own. Without the Council, and without you. Despite being a minor character, Isla Sakura was chosen to stand among other Jedi like Windu, Obi-Wan, Anakin, Qui-Gon, Yoda, and Luke, as one of the voices that give Rey encouragement at the end of Episode 9. Surrounds me, Ray. Let's guide you. It's pretty surreal, being at your own funeral. 